So class, we've heard of communism, of its iron fist and its maximum exponent of the USSR and Stalin. But this is only one version of it. There are other communist groups. Wait, but teacher, I thought communism was about making everyone the same. <laughs> oh, oh, Will, thinking that the subjugation of people's inherent individuality is possible? <laughs> Stupid Will. No, really, seriously. To quote Karl Marx, communism and the theory of communism may be summed up in one sentence. Abolish all private property. That way, Will can't live in his house. Which would be great. Communism was first devised as a feasible doctrine of government by, you guessed it, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels in their famous pamphlet, The Communist Manifesto. The gist of their ideas is basically, as said before, to get rid of all private property and nationalize all property so it can be given to everyone, so Will doesn't have to live in his cardboard box anymore. He divided society into tiers. He called them the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, the employer and the laborer. He thought that the bourgeoisie, which is actually pretty true, in the 19th century gave the workers very meager labor conditions, and so he aimed to seize the property of the bourgeoisie and redistribute it equally around both the proletariat and bourgeoisie to create an equal society. These ideas have since inspired many political figures and governments throughout the world. But the truth is, they have never, ever shaped a country, not since the USSR. Um, no, I know about a communist group that influenced a country. Oh, really, Isa? Then why don't you come and teach a class, huh? The Shining Path, or Sendero Luminoso, was a left-wing terrorist movement in Peru starting up from 1980 and declining in 1992 with the capture of its leader, Abimael Guzman. This is its very original flag. The group began after former philosophy professor Guzman visited China and adopted Maoism and brought it back to Lima, starting up in the mountains where his a terrorist organization began working its way down to the big cities such as Lima, spreading terrorist tactics along the way. Guzman also drew inspiration from Peru's official Communist Party, but a failing one. To quote its founder, José Manguetui, El marxismo-leninismo abrirá el sendero luminoso hacia la revolución. Or, Marxism-Leninism will open the shining path to the revolution. This, evidently, is where Abismael Guzman got the name for the terrorist group. The group is responsible for over 70,000 reported deaths and missing people. The group fought with guerrilla tactics, targeting mostly civilians and anyone affiliated with the government. Shining Path proclaimed their cause as Guerra Popular, meaning the popular war, established mostly through their propaganda. The group's aim was to overthrow the Peruvian government and to institute communism throughout the entire country in order to bring justice to the common people who were being ignored by the government. But ironically enough, most of the targeted people were the citizens, meaning the ones who they were trying to defend were the ones who were being attacked. Some of the things they did is that they forced most of the citizens not to vote, meaning that they were forcing the people not to support the government. Furthermore, one of their most popular tactics was to place bombs in trunks and put them next to buildings in order to blow up buildings. Also, every time that they would pass through and consequently burn a village, they would most of the time recruit all of the children in order to build a stronger army. And lastly, another one of their tactics was that they created a death list about every week with the names of all the government officials or any government related personnel in order to target them, letting them know that they were going to be the next victim of their assaults. The whole group, especially Guzman, worked in their self-interest in order to emerge as the next rulers of Peru. Guzman and his followers self-proclaimed him as the fourth sword of communism after Marx, Lenin, and Mao. This name was one that he made for himself in order to distinguish himself from other attempted communist parties in Peru. The Shining Path seek to obtain power using terrorist tactics. On the other hand, the Soviet Union obtained their power through a bloody revolution and kept it through an oppressive regime. The goal of the Shining Path was to create an insurgency and overthrow the Peruvian government and install communism because that is what they believed would benefit the majority of the Peruvian people. Overall, this left-wing resistance movement furthered their communist goal through terrorist tactics during their 12-year reign of terror. Well, Isa, you'll make a great lecturer someday. But who cares? It's just one thing, and it's the only one in South America. 
No, haven't you heard about FARC in Colombia? Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia is a left-wing terrorist group from Colombia that started in 1964 and is still active. The guerrilla group is known for being responsible for over 200,000 deaths and drug dealing, but, but most important of all is the largest and most powerful guerrilla in Colombia. The FARC originated at the start of the civil war between conservatives and liberals. This started a new chapter in Colombia's story. The initial beliefs remain in their ideology, even distribution of land and wealth, non-military solution to the drug problem, more money spent on social welfare. Some of those ideas can be seen in the next quote. With the riches in this country and after 180 years of republic living, Colombians must live better. We'll make better, better use of natural resources and provide jobs, healthcare, education and housing so that 40 million Colombians can live well, said C Simon Trinidad. He was a high-ranking member of the group. So, even though the FARC lacked political and military strength to overpower the Col Colombian government, they did have enough power to diminish their power in, in some places. This damage had affected in areas where the Colombia's institutions weren't as powerful because the guerrillas or drug cartels were there. Moreover, the impact this terrorist group had not only in Colombia but also in the US was enormous. This is why those two governments created Plan Colombia to restore the peace in the country. The US contributed with over $8 billion. However, another main reason for the US FARC conflict is the fact that they provided large quantities of cocaine to the US. One of the various actions listed in the document that stated the actions that the US and Colombia would take to solve some of the problems that the FARC were creating is a human development strategy to promote efforts to guarantee, within the next few years, adequate education and health, to provide opportunities to every young Colombian and to help vulnerable groups in our society, including not just those affected and displaced by violence, but also those in conditions of extreme poverty. All in all, as we mentioned, the group is still active and using intimidation and violence so that the government will listen to their requests. Okay, Martina, two examples in uncivilized South America, but it's not like any important continents have had communist uprisings. Wait, no, I know about one in Europe. Is that not important enough? So, in Europe, the Red Army faction, also known as the Bader Meinhof Group, operated in West Germany during the 70s and 80s. During its heights in the 70s, it was the center of West German pro politics, with constant bombings, assassinations, kidnappings and murders. In total, the Red Army faction committed 34 murders in order to drive their political agenda. The group was founded by Andreas Bader, Gudrun Enslin and Ulrike Meinhof, uh, who all wanted to remove past Nazis from power and change the structure of the country. Ulrike Meinhof thought that the only way to change their society was by using violence. She wrote an art article stating that It has been documented that common decency is a shackle that can only be broken if those wearing the shackles are beaten and shot at. The movement grew out of a very angry younger generation who thought that the older generation had messed up their countries by allowing Nazis to still be in power and now they had to suffer from the consequences. They believed that people who had been involved in the Nazi party in the 40s had not been punished enough because there were still people in power who had had a Nazi past. The Red Army was also strong opposers to Western imperialism and fought for justice for Palestine, famously by hijacking a pla plane for five days uh, in order to, to free some people who were fighting for, for Palestine. They believed that Western governments were treating civilians very bad. However, they never criticized Soviet for treating civilians bad as well. For example, in an article, Meinhof criticizes the Allies strongly for their bombings of, of Dresden in the World War II, but she never mentions the, the massacres and rapes committed by the USSR in that time as well. Even though the Red Army faction supported the Soviet a lot, they did differ because their reason for adopting communism was very different. USSR created a revolution and adopted communism in order to improve the conditions of the workers and the peasants. The Red Army faction, on the other hand, was created in order to remove the Nazis still in power and to empower the younger generation. 
These goals, however, were never met because instead of changing the structure of the country, the government just fought them back fiercely and because of their bloody attacks, the opinion of the country has changed to a more right-wing opinion. And this made it just harder for younger generations and students to actually create any change in the country. Okay, kids. I'll admit it. I've had a little change of heart here. You guys were right. But actually, I thought of one country that was also influenced by communism. So, well, anyways. Let's start with this country, Cuba. In Cuba, there was the 26th of July movement, and they aimed to take out of power US-backed dictator Batista. On the 26th of July of 1959, they marched on Havana. Long story short, Fidel Castro was the dictator. Soon, Cuba was doing great, better than ever. But let's look at some numbers. This is uh, by Garrison Brady. Ah, look at that. Highest literacy rate in all of Latin America and lowest infant mortality. This was the new Cuba, one that existed under the Marxist-inspired ideals of Che Guevara and Fidel Castro. Che Guevara highlights most of these new ideals in a letter to a Uruguayan Marxist magazine. Che Guevara seeks to intrinsically link work and creativity. In his words, to link this new status of work to the development of technology, which will enable greater freedoms. So, something that illustrates this beautiful, beautifully is the Cuban art schools. And they seek to provide world-class education for everyone around the world for free. So you see, we can really see Che Guevara's ideas of creative expression and art through these new buildings that he was trying to create. These buildings were, sure, very beautiful, but they weren't really efficient with their building materials. And soon, Cuba was economically crippled. It was full of embargoes imposed by the US and its allies. So who did Cuba look to for a trading partner? The USSR. Now the USSR really did condemn these art schools as an improper use of materials. So the art schools shut down and they were never finished. Instead in Cuba, many buildings with a stocky, square, really effective way of building of the USSR came to existence. And never again in communist Cuba did we see such a beautiful architectural creation. Value of efficiency that the USSR had ultimately trumped Guevara's ideas of individualism. Now both are very communist countries, but as you can see, communism was clearly interpreted in different ways. So kids, we clearly learned something today. Communism can show its face in many ways. It is important to always know that you can't just make one simple definition of one huge concept or ideology. Complexity will always resist simplicity. We started this lesson with a notion of communism and associated to brutal images of the USSR. But now we've learned that communism, like every other idea ever created, is actually nuanced. Now we know that communism is an institution that or origins from necessity, and it's not some diabolical evil institution. It's actually a solution to a problem. Whether you think it's a good one or not, that's where it comes from. Now it seems obvious that communism defers, like any other ideology, from place to place, country to country, person to person, different individuals who have different ideas. Now, communism has sparked a lot of debate throughout the years because of its endless violence, it would seem. But is communism to blame for this? Or is revolution, when met with obstacle, so powerful that it is a catalyst for inevitable violence? Think of the art schools now, the realization impeded because of economic reasons. Who is to blame for this? Who is to blame for the destruction of such a beautiful endeavor in the arts and human spirit? Are these left-wing groups responsible for this violence, or is the condition of their lives such a breeding ground for violence? Maybe where they lived created the necessity for violence? The truth is, I don't know, and you don't know either. And these are questions we have to answer before judging. Communism was created to create an equal and just society. If you think it achieves its goal, good. If not, well, okay. But I ask you this, if you had the chance to create such a perfect world, would you fight for it? Or does your world not entail violence?